And I intend then to take some of the international questions that were asked and see if I can um, if I can uh, weave them into the presentation that we will next do. Thank you, Chairperson. Thank you very much, uh, Minister. Oh, it's Honourable Minister, you are a member of Parliament. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yeah, I think uh, given the the outstanding work on the entity oversight framework and unit and the performance, some of the performance targets that haven't been met, we will then continue to robustly oversight the, the work of, of DTIC um, when we look at your report for the fourth quarter. Thank you very much, Minister. We will reconvene members. We'll have a short body break of five minutes, and then we'll reconvene for the next agenda item on trade negotiations and the relations. Then continue at uh, body break of five minutes. Thank you very much.
again, thank you for the opportunity to uh, uh, share with the committee uh, some of the work we're doing on trade negotiations and trade relations. Uh, we um, <clears throat> uh, want to try in the presentation to cover uh, a few areas of work, and I'm going to try also to uh, focus on the questions that came up in the previous session. Uh, so we're just getting our presentation lined up uh, uh, properly. Okay, there we are. So um, <clears throat> by way of an introduction, Chairperson, the our trade policy aims to support industrial development, sustainable economic growth, decent work, and economic inclusion. Our trade policy also seeks to improve our trade performance by increasing exports of higher value added manufactured goods. Societies have the, the um, <clears throat> uh, opportunity to simply stay at the most basic primary level of development. That's what colonialism did to, um, to Africa. It confined us to be the providers of raw materials uh, that fueled the factories uh, of Europe. And um, uh, our challenge has been, and the, the post-colonial agenda across the continent has been how to get more manufacturing, more value-added products that employ skilled labor and brings science, innovation, um, uh, improved tax collection, uh, better social services, and so on uh, to societies. And the gap between the vision and the reality is what policy must address. And it comes back to uh, an issue that's come up in the previous session around beneficiation. Our trade policy is beginning to resonate globally. Uh, when we made the comments that uh, we've made prior to uh, COVID-19, before the pandemic, there were, uh, South Africa was part of a number of developing countries talking about industrial policy, but there were many in the developed world who were skeptical and publicly critical of our stance. What we've seen now is the return of industrial policy across the world. We've seen the European Union and the United States embrace a hard version of industrial policy. Uh, the United States, for example, has uh, passed uh, a quaintly named uh, law called the, um, uh, the IRA, uh, the Inflation Reduction Act. But what at, at the heart of the uh, act is a, an attempt to build American industry, green industries, and it's putting enormous sums of money uh, on the table. And that has led to a, a dispute between, a public dispute between the European Union and the United States. Uh, the European Union in turn, responding to this uh, decision by the United States, has um, uh, publicly launched its own uh, uh, green industrialization plan. We've seen with semiconductors, the return of industrial policy where governments across the world are supporting and financing the work uh, that is being done to build uh, semiconductor production capacity outside of uh, Taiwan and the limited places where it's historically been concentrated. And so for Africa and uh, for uh, our neighbors, South Africa has worked to advance continental economic integration and industrialization. We'll share a little bit of the information shortly, but South Africa's non-Africa engagement uh, must support this. So in our trade engagements with the United States, with the European Union, we put front and center the importance of the African continental free trade area, and that we need uh, to work in partnership with other parts of the world, that we enhance Africa's industrial capability. And it must correct the manufacturing deficit in 
South Africa's trade profile with the rest of the world and in Africa's um, profile with the rest of the world. Uh, we favor multilateralism. In other words, that rules are made globally by agreement between countries and that that multilateralism must be founded on a developmental approach. Uh, we seek to address the existing imbalances in trade rules. Many of the trade rules that applied to South Africa were negotiated by um, <clears throat> uh, officials of the apartheid government, and they were uh, effectively ones that were a fait accompli when we did our transition in 1994. So within that, in the Uruguay round of trade talks, South Africa was um, uh, burdened with a number of disciplines that don't apply to many other developing countries. So our job then is to secure policy space to pursue uh, stronger industrialization and ensure that new challenges, for example, health security that the pandemic underlined and environmental security uh, that uh, floods and droughts are, are pointing to, that these are addressed fairly and equitably. On the trade negotiations, we engage with uh, countries uh, and uh, regional groupings across the world. For our primary negotiation, we do it through the World Trade Organization. We have uh, more than 150 countries represented there. Uh, much of the discussion there is very technical in nature. Uh, so we are involved in that discussion. In any given week, there will be an engagement that South Africa uh, has to have, either bilaterally or in the form of forums to deal with trade-related issues. We engage with other trade ministers and officials uh, on the African continent through the African Continental Free Trade Area. And we attend meetings of uh, trade ministers to finalize the work that the officials do. In SADC, that's the Southern African Development Community, and SACU, the Southern African Customs Union, we have a council of ministers and officials that meet regularly. And a lot of our trade work is conducted through that. With the European Union, we have an economic partnership agreement and uh, that agreement provides the legal framework for uh, the uh, trade relations uh, with the European Union. And uh, from time to time, uh, that agreement is reviewed. On the United Kingdom, we have uh, an economic partnership agreement with the UK following uh, Brexit. Uh, and uh, on a goer with the United States, we have engagements, there's a special provision that the U.S. Congress has introduced called the uh, Africa Growth and Opportunities Act, and that provides sub-Saharan African countries market access on preferential basis to the U.S. market. We have um, uh, some uh, preferential trade agreements uh, with other uh, trading partners, for example, with Mercosur. These are Latin American countries, uh, and we have also uh, various uh, types of free trade, trade arrangements on the African continent. SADC itself, of course, is one. We also have uh, others. There are bilateral discussions. From time to time, we'll meet with large trading partners, China, India, uh, uh, Japan, many others that we would meet with. And so many times when we have these meetings, either in South Africa or abroad with the trading partners, it's to address the normal day-to-day -day opportunities that arise or to deal with day-to-day -day challenges uh, that there are. Our trade with the rest of the world is uh, very significant. Uh, for 2022, uh, on the provisional SARS data, uh, we exported just over 2 trillion rands worth of goods, and we imported 1.8 trillion rands worth of goods. We had a positive trade balance in our favor for goods of 195 billion rand. If we look at the composition of our trade, honorable members will see in that very second column, which is uh, 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 termed exports, 
that the 2013 are in billions of rands, so that would make it, um, uh, well, uh, millions of rands, so that would make it 2 trillion rand. And um, if we break that 2 trillion rand of exports up, you go one down to agriculture, that would account for 118 billion rand. Manufactured products would account for 909 billion rand. And commodities, uh, which would be largely mining uh, products, would be 942 billion rand. So that's the export profile. Uh, honorable members will also see the import profile there with 1.8 billion rands worth of imports. We don't import much agricultural products uh, or commodities, for it, but we import a significant quantity of manufactured products. And that's really where the argument is for deeper industrialization and deeper localization. We've made a lot of progress, but there is still significant opportunities to do more. We've provided in the slide some figures on our growth um, over a one year and over a 10 year period. If we look at over a 10 year period, our exports have grown by 121% uh, uh, with uh, imports growing by 83%. And if you break that down, you see very significant growth in agriculture, in manufacturing and commodities. In each of these areas, our export growth has been faster than the growth of imports. We also provide the same information for a one year period and honorable members will see uh, the growth in, uh, uh, in exports and imports uh, for, for the period. Obviously with exports being larger, our base is larger. So even in some cases, while the import growth has been higher as a percentage, uh, we still a significant exporter of goods. Moving on, um, our, uh, th this just makes the point that the uh, uh, trade hit an all-time high last year. Uh, the data is still preliminary. It's subject to change. But as I indicated, SARS estimates were that exports were uh, accounted for 2 trillion rand and imports 1.8 uh, trillion. Um, our exports uh, grew mainly due to strong exports of key mining products like coal and chrome alongside an all-time high in manufacturing exports. We had high prices for export commodities like maize and fertilizer, and that does um, inflate the export values. But we have also had a higher growth or strong growth in manufacturing products like cars and pharmaceuticals that um, appear to result from real changes in export volumes. And in the previous presentation, I provided details on the number of cars we had exported to just give that as an illustration of successes that we're beginning to, to make. While manufacturing exports perform well, part of this uh, could be from companies exporting some unsold, unsold stocks from the COVID period uh, because we had um, an all-time high of inventories. Inventories are goods that you've made that you haven't yet sold. Imports grew by 32%, primarily due to record petroleum imports. So because oil prices went up, our import bill also grew very substantially. And that was a growth of 55% in value. Now, yes, surging crude prices are a major driver of this growth. But there's also been a very large increase in diesel imports. And this is likely driven by ESCOM. Um, uh, so it's fuel prices, but also higher diesel because of the energy challenges. Diesel imports more than doubled from 71 billion rand to 182 uh, billion rand. This is just a graph to show our uh, profile with different parts of the world. Africa is green. <clears throat> so uh, honorable members will see the rise in African exports. Uh, red is the United, uh, the European Union. You'll see a sharp rise there. The US, um, uh, while there's been a slight moderation, it, it was followed a, a relatively large rise. And the dotted uh, line on top are all of our goods exports. 
But we don't only export goods. We also export services. Uh, and services would be your banking services, telecommunications, uh, those kind of things. And the dotted, um, the striped line at the bottom is the uh, services exports, which uh, dropped during COVID and is beginning to recover. This is our import um, profile. And honorable members will again see the, uh, the um, uh, show. Uh, it shows the story from 2012 to 2022, that 10 year period. Moving on to uh, WTO negotiations, uh, we did provide a more detailed report on the outcome of the WTO negotiations in June 2022, uh, and that we did in the in the uh, in the quarter two report, quarter one and quarter two report. The WTO General Council has now approved that the 13th ministerial conference will be held in the United Arab Emirates February next year. And it will be followed by uh, one in Cameroon, uh, probably in 2025. Trade tensions have been rising globally even before the pandemic. And both protectionism and unilateralism is on the rise, including in relation to climate measures. The European Union has proven to be uh, prepared to use climate as an excuse to um, support their own industries, and that's going to weaken the global fight uh, against climate change. The geopolitical tensions, the pandemic, rising food insecurity and climate change have disrupted global supply chains, and government policies are encouraging diversification and domestic manufacturing so that we build resilience. The key uh, negotiations at the World Trade Organization included one on trade-related intellectual property, uh, that's TRIPS, the extension of uh, the decision uh, uh, to, uh, to enable developing countries to use intellectual property uh, to make necessary medication. We want to extend that decision to therapeutics and diagnostics. We're dealing with trade and industrial policy issues, the nexus between these, uh, agriculture, fisheries, and the uh, issue of trade and development. And that trade and development issue goes to the heart uh, of the issues raised by Honorable Tring about enabling a country like South Africa to beneficiate, to use its mineral base. And it also then, uh, we deal with um, uh, issues of um, uh, uh, special and differential treatment for developing countries and trade in the environment. At the last World Trade uh, Organization's meeting of ministers, we agreed to work on reform of the World Trade Organization, that it must be member-driven, open, transparent, and inclusive. And for South Africa, the agenda is very clear. We want to rebalance trade rules to facilitate African industrialization. We want to deliver on mandated issues. We find very often um, a number of trading partners will agree to things at the World Trade Organization, but then fail to um, uh, move the discussion forward. One of it is market access on agriculture to the European Union. We want to preserve the core principles of the World Trade Organization and address unilateralism, like the measures being taken by the EU on climate change. The World Trade Organization's dispute settlement body has been disabled, mainly due to US concerns on the functioning of the appellate body. So we're working to see uh, how we can build consensus on addressing this. And um, uh, the commitment has been made by many countries now to try to have the system up and running by 2024. Trade with the rest of Africa is a critical part of our agenda. And honorable members will see uh, that we have a vigorous trade with uh, the continent. It grew 28% year on year, uh, the exports, and it grew 88% over a 10 year period. Uh, the bulk of our exports are manufactured products, uh, which is uh, quite quite key. 
389 billion rand. We also buy quite a bit of manufactured products from the rest of the African continent, 119 billion rand. And um, we, uh, we import uh, some commodities and some agriculture. Our negotiations uh, with uh, neighboring countries and the rest of the continent was, uh, was launched for an African continental free trade area in June 2015. Uh, 54 countries have signed, 44, actually that 44 should now be uh, 47 countries have either ratified or about to ratify. Uh, we uh, provide information here on the phase one negotiation on goods, on services, and on dispute settlement mechanisms. The phase two one on investment, intellectual property, competition, digital trade, and women and youth in trade. We've done enormous uh, progress in a limited time on the agreement establishing the AFC FTA on protocols on trading goods, uh, services, and uh, uh, procedures for settlement of disputes. The operational phase was launched in July 2019, and in December 2020, under President Ramaphosa's chairpersonship, the AU summit created the basis for preferential trade, and all it required was rules of origin must be agreed, uh, and um, countries must put a, an offer on the table. On trade with the European Union, yes, the numbers, we export uh, 436 uh, billion rands worth of goods. We import 398 billion rands worth of goods. Historically, we mainly exported minerals. We've been really growing our manufacturing exports, and uh, that has now grown to 211 billion rand. And honorable members will see uh, the growth uh, over a period of time uh, with um, uh, uh, exports, uh, uh, manufacturing exports grew 179% over a 10 year period. We have a SADC uh, EU partnership agreement that covers uh, a number of uh, countries. Uh, and um, uh, as a bloc, the European Union is still our largest trading partner. Uh, we have the IPA in place since uh, October 2016. Uh, we give an example here where SACO imposed a safeguard measure against EU poultry imports. Um, and uh, the European Union challenged that measure two years later. And we had arbitration. The outcome largely favored SACO. It rejected the EU request to remove safeguard measures and refund uh, the European Union uh, with the duties that um, we, we had imposed. The review of the SADC EU IPA is underway. Uh, parties have exchanged ind indicative lists of issues of interest. The um, South Africa has identified some areas, rules of origin, export tax, market access. The European Union has looked at areas of investment, competition, intellectual property, and sustainable development. And so obviously with these negotiations, we're not, uh, neither side is negotiating publicly, but the European Union has asked for additional time for them to be able to do uh, bigger impact studies uh, on uh, the, the impact of uh, IPA. Uh, and um, uh, they, uh, they've said that it will take about 12 months for that to be uh, successfully concluded. One of the issues we've raised with the European Union, and I've raised it with um, my counterparts in the discussions, is we are concerned that as South Africa's export performance improves, as we become more successful in exporting, it appears that the European Union is finding more ways of frustrating market access. And um, uh, Honorable Tlongyana made the point in the previous uh, discussion that on citrus, uh, it seems that some countries want to take from our economy and not um, give. Uh, and um, uh, that, that very clearly is uh, a worry that we have. And, uh, and we've raised it now at the highest level uh, with uh, uh, the European Union. We value the relationship with the European Union. It's an important economic relationship for South Africa. But given that we are a developing 
part of the world. We do uh, hope and expect the European Union will be less protectionist and uh, somewhat more flexible in accommodating our needs. And the citrus export issue is a key matter, but it's not the only area where we have problems. We've had our game meat blocked in the past. We've had horses, um, export of horses um, blocked. We've had um, surcharges on our steel exports and on poultry. Now, of course, it's not to say that only South Africa faces this. Between any uh, two trading partners, you'll have a long list of issues. Sometimes the media storylines show the um, the inability of commentators to, to understand the world we really live in. And they see only the South African uh, European Union or the South African US thing. And um, they don't understand that trade is about fighting your corner and finding opportunity uh, to industrialize and grow uh, economies. On the um, uh, citrus matter, I dealt with it in the um, uh, previous presentation, but perhaps let me just add the point uh, looking at the um, the matters that have come up. I welcome, uh, uh, Honorable Cuthbert, your um, uh, support for government's position on uh, the false codling moth, and it's a, um, it's a fig leaf it's really, in our view, uh, not warranted by the science and by trade rules. Trade rules are very clear. Even if you have a problem, your solution needs to be uh, proportionate and appropriate. <clears throat> and um, we don't believe it is. So this is the first time that we've lodged a complaint at the World Trade Organization. And um, uh, we, uh, we will be taking this matter forward. We've done many meetings with the European Union, including at um, uh, the most senior levels to see if we can address this. But uh, no doubt the fact that um, Spain has an election pending has meant that protectionist um, uh, uh, tendencies have crept in. And I raise that because we would like all parliamentarians to back the South African agenda, not just on citrus fruit, but on all of these. This is what countries do. They close their markets if they feel the rules allow them, and others challenge that. But often in our discourse, um, uh, we have uh, public commentators here uh, being um, uh, unmindful of uh, the South African agenda. And as government, we keep our eye on that agenda, and we are, we are pursuing that agenda in our discussions. Um, uh, the um, <clears throat> partnership agreement with the, the UK, um, uh, what we call the SACUM, this, which is SACU plus Mozambique. Uh, uh, we've had some further discussions during the, the state visit uh, with the UK. And um, it's early days for this agreement, but we believe that there's scope to increase the quotas for certain South African products like sugar um, uh, and um, certain beverages in the UK market. Trade with the United States is also an important part of uh, our, our trade uh, agenda and our economic agenda. We exported 177 billion rands worth of goods uh, uh, in the last uh, year, and we imported 133 billion rands worth of goods. And uh, there's a, a growing portion of our uh, uh, products that are now manufactured products. So honorable members will see that uh, we, we're trying to break <clears throat> that um, neo-colonial pattern uh, by finding more manufactured products. We have in a number of cases, companies that are working very actively to access the, uh, the United States market. We have um, had very friendly uh, relations with uh, US policymakers on uh, a number of opportunities that there are, but there is more that we think we can do. Over the, um, uh, the period that we're looking at, the 10-year period, we've grown our manufactured exports by 77%. Um, and uh, we, we think that more can be done. There. So a lot of our effort now is really uh, engaging the US government on uh, uh, greater opportunities that there are. Moving to uh, the Africa Growth and Opportunities Act. The act is set to expire in 2025. 
uh, the act enables eligible sub-Saharan countries to, um, to access the market. We got all the trade ministers of the AGOA countries together in December last year, and uh, they agreed on a common position on AGOA, which is to extend AGOA beyond its 2025 expiry period. Uh, they also agreed to imp uh, that we should uh, engage our American partners to improve product and country coverage and remove U.S. non-tariff barriers. For example, the United States has imposed steel and, um, and aluminium trade restrictions on products coming from South Africa. And um, we've had um, African countries uh, taking a common view that we should, we should make the point that um, those measures should be removed. Uh, we've also got agreement that we should uh, uh, oppose graduating, which is the exclusion of certain sub-Saharan countries from AGOA on the basis that those countries have now become sufficiently um, strong to no longer need this. Uh, part of our engagement with the United States is about supporting Africa's industrialization and our integration efforts, and to encourage increased American investment in manufacturing and in infrastructure on the African continent and in South Africa. We're due to host the AGOA Forum in 2023 this year, and it will um, be an opportunity for trade ministers from different African countries to meet with our US counterparts in trade, but also in the other core departments that um, uh, 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 in the US administration focuses on uh, the economic relationship. In uh, the US uh, Africa Leaders Summit, uh, we uh, met um, with a range of American policymakers. Uh, some of the details have been included in the previous report that I tabled earlier today. And we also have met with American businesses, uh, the American Chamber of Commerce and others. One of the matters that came up in uh, the discussion earlier is um, uh, tensions that uh, there are around um, uh, foreign policy issues, and uh, we we are engaging uh, American counterparts on it. Uh, we have pointed both to South Africa's um, <clears throat> the important economic relationship for both countries, for the United States and for South Africa. And while at the moment we we can see the trade data on goods, there's also significant American services exports to South Africa. And of course, South Africa is a major supplier of critical minerals to US manufacturing operations. So we provide uh, enormous quantities of raw materials uh, that power the American uh, economy. And so uh, there are friendly relationships between the two heads of state. Very unusually, um, uh, our president was uh, invited to a meeting um, uh, with the US. Um, bilaterally last year during a time when these kind of meetings were limited and they pointed to the importance uh, that both countries attach to the relationship. Megaphone diplomacy, where we are announcing and, and dealing with every media report, in our view, just troubles the relationship. So sometimes we're able to get better understanding of each other's positions by meeting each other uh, traveling either to each other's countries or engaging uh, through our officials. And so uh, we, we're working very closely uh, with, um, there are some uh, uh, persons in the US Congress that are very supportive of the extension of AGOA. Uh, the US administration itself sees value to um, the deepening the economic relationship with the African continent. And so uh, we have to navigate all the complexities and challenges as smartly as we can, recognizing always that the United States account for a very significant economic uh, 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 and, and jobs dividend in uh, South Africa. And so as we navigate this, we want to be able to do more, trade more, have a deeper investment um, uh, commitment. We are um, the United States' biggest uh, trading partner uh, on the continent. If you take 
the diversified trade basket as the basis. Uh, we also a uh, very significant uh, source uh, uh, for American investors on the African continent. And interestingly, we also invest heavily in the U.S. economy itself. Sasol has a large plant um, in Louisiana uh, that accounts for a significant outward investment from South Africa to the United States. So trade relations, Chair, as I conclude, are an important part of the work that we do by their nature, unless um, uh, a relationship has got to a point where all diplomacy has failed, uh, the, the discussions on, uh, on uh, overall strategy and the um, <clears throat> how to resolve difficult issues are, are typically dealt with in bilateral discussions uh, uh, between countries. But I hope that this does provide a basis and a framework of how South Africa engages with the world. We, we've had a very significant impact at the World Trade Organization ministerial meeting where South Africa was uh, critical to a couple of key agreements being reached. And we probably have a more active bilateral relationship with all of the key trading economies of the world than most developing countries would have. And it comes from history plus the pivotal role that South Africa plays uh, on the African continent. I thank you very much for this opportunity, Chairperson. Thank you very much, Minister. I see Honorable Cuthbert's hand is up. I now invite uh, PC members to engage with the Minister's um, presentation. Honorable Cuthbert. Honorable. Those are the hands I see for now. Can uh, we start with Honorable Cuthbert? Thank you very much, Chair. Uh, thank you to the Minister. I think he addressed some of the questions that I asked during the previous presentation, but I imagine he's noted the balance and will respond to them when he responds to the committee now regarding the documents that are cited. Um, also, just to have a better understanding of exactly what uh, you know, new relationships would be sought if there was an impact on that 30%, which I spoke to earlier on in the previous presentation. I think that's most important. Um, I tend to agree with the minister's assessment of the political considerations that are taken into account, particularly in light of citrus. And I don't think that, you know, the science that has been supplied by the EU necessarily justifies the kind of actions that have been taken. And I mean, I think this is just a continuation of citrus black spot. Um, however, I do think that it is broader than that. And like the minister said, there have been other items that have, in fact, been targeted. But I think the behavior has been, uh, you know, reciprocal from South Africa in many respects. And the fear that I have, and I, I don't want to sound like a doomsayer, is not necessarily that there is a a degradation of relations to an extent where the relationship no longer exists. However, what I'm concerned about is the fact that we are, you know, a primary partner on the continent. And I fear that we might find ourselves in a position because of, uh, you know, national government stance in this conflict, as well as historical behavior that may relegate us to the lower rungs of partners on the continent. And there, there may well be a different focus from international partners on other countries that seem to show more promise and more stability. So that is a concern that I have. Then a practical question that I have for the minister uh, concerning the WTO dispute that has been lodged. Now, the natural conclusion of that WTO dispute would possibly be for it to reach the appellate body. Now, because the appellate body is disabled, you know, what type of recourse do we then have because of it being disabled? I mean, that would imply then that we could only take the dispute up until a certain level until it would pretty much sit um, in, a, in a stalemate, unless any kind of bilateral effort 
or maybe a broader multilateral effort was, uh, you know, conceived for us to come together either just with the EU or with a series of like-minded partners. So if you could just, uh, you know, spell out what the practical implications of that would be. I think it's important that we, we know what is possible and what we are able to then do as a result of that. Then I would just like to find out from the minister if he thinks that the same actions which I've previously referred to in light of the Russian-Ukrainian conflict, and I know it's often spoken about and I don't want to belabor the point, but does he hold the opinion that there will be any kind of sanctions that are forthcoming as a result of the stances we've taken in the United Nations General Assembly, the fact that we've allowed for military exercises to be hosted on our shores. Does he, in a realistic way, perceive any threat of sanctions? And if sanctions were to come about, what would be his response to that? And how would we be able to navigate that situation? Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. Uh, I have uh, network challenges, which is probably due to load shedding. So I was logged out uh, for a while, but I'm back in now. Um, but I'm sure, Minister, you've managed to capture all Honourable Cuthbert's questions. Honourable Rumbiani. Honourable Chairperson, thank you very much for the opportunity. And let me welcome also the elaborate presentation by the minister in terms of the trade and also the negotiations arrangement. <clears throat> Honorable Minister, I am not sure of the SPS declaration, the Secret Black Spot, whether as South African government, we can have a protectionist measure or changing of the requirement. Also, the question of overfishing, uh, since long ago, I just want to check with you the e-commerce uh, in terms of monitoring electronic transformation as well. Uh, on the issue of uh, the priorities of the world trade, I think it's food security and also production and energy security. I just want to check with you, Minister, the role of private sector in adaptation uh, project in terms of loans, oxygen, and also uh, UTF. Uh, let me continue. Uh, Chair, the issues of uh, enhancing the transparent in the WTO, whether it's sustainable trade of plastic pollution, fishery subsidies agreement, and also trade and development agenda. Uh, I just want to check the minister in terms of the diversification of global supply, chain management, uh, also marginalization and uh, reassurance in terms of the re-globalization process. Because we understand that trade is an instrument to promote and create jobs, supporting enhancement and development. Uh, Maybe the second last, uh, the transformation reforms to build a, a 21st century competitive economy as per the agreement by the MC12 outcomes. Uh, like to appreciate the political will. Uh, also, it, it was shown as a success uh, because all members are willing and agreeing to deal with the processes. Yeah, and the major, major driver of this change in economic development is a question of equity and high value supply chain that will be able to promote logistics and infrastructure. Yeah, I just want to check what the role should the trade investment play in achieving the sustainable development and also the transformation. The trade can play a vital role in underdevelopment the country also the transparencies around key trade subsidies. Uh, the last one, Chair, it's around the facilitating investment for green growth, including women and uh, young people. 
in, instrument of the past, also large coal uh, power plant, SME strategic uh, support, uh, development risk, uh, also the financing aspects in terms of facilitating the investment for green growth. Uh, e-local manufacturing in terms of the local content production times. Uh, yeah, we'll pause there for now, Chairperson. Maybe we'll be given another round. But uh, if, as I conclude, Chair, the mainstreaming development in the WTO, uh, more especially in framing the future of trade, reforming and strengthening the organization, require a mainstreaming development in the WTO and also explores way in which the multilateral trading system can meaningfully address the need of developing countries, including the LDC. Uh, I'll pause there for now. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity, Chair. Thank you very much. We have just four minutes left for this meeting, um, but let's see if we can manage. I'm sure we members won't mind if we go slightly over time. Minister. Thank you very much, Chairperson, and thank you for the uh, questions that were put uh, on the, the, the matters uh, uh, that Honourable Cuthbert raised on uh, geopolitical uh, tensions and challenges. Look, I think there always are factors that we do need to take into account. Um, what we have as the bedrock of our system is the World Trade Organization rules, which are uh, 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 based on what is called the most favored nation principle, which means that um, South Africa can always rely on that. With the European Union, we have a binding agreement, which is the Economic Partnership Agreement, which South Africa can also rely on. Where we have uh, a challenge, obviously, are with voluntary systems that are unilateral in character. And a GOA is a unilateral measure, meaning the United States has made that available to sub-Saharan African countries, and uh, uh, they are able to withdraw it. So we would still have access to, um, to, to the U.S. market, but on less preferential terms, on the same terms that everybody else has uh, preference to, uh, uh, to the U.S. market. So I think that what we need to do is um, uh, constantly reinforce the, uh, uh, the uh, economic benefits that both parties get. So, for example, we have uh, just recently agreed to um, to update the uh, quota on American poultry uh, in line with the agreement that we had reached uh, previously with the United States. So it's just uh, every year the formula gets adjusted because both sides benefit from an economic relationship. I know that it's not headline making these kind of comments, but a lot of the benefit for a country comes from the quiet diplomacy that uh, that it uh, needs to undertake. Um, uh, on the appellate body uh, and the WTO dispute that Honorable Cuthbert raised, it, it's it's a matter that we've given some thought to. There are two challenges that we think we, we, we have to navigate, and the European Union is familiar with both of these, and parties are always familiar with the rules, and there is a tendency in many cases for parties to game the rules. And so the US, uh, the European Union is aware that um, we are entitled to take the matter to the WTO, that um, uh, while it's a time-consuming process, that there will be uh, an outcome of that process, and that um, uh, at the level of uh, public opinion, we would certainly have made our case strongly. Uh, the absence of the appellate uh, body means that we have two options. One option is to agree to arbitration on the matter, and uh, the EU has reached that kind of understanding with, part with other parties in the past. So that is an option that is available. It's not one that we can guarantee, but it is one that uh, there is precedent uh, for it. Um, at a wider level, though, uh, what is very clear is that the European Union would have to evaluate whether the political cost of the unfair treatment of South Africa on citrus uh, is worth it, because uh, uh, Europe has made the argument about its support for democracy, but uh, its actions in this instance are not consistent with that. Mm -hmm. It's made the point about 
African development. He doesn't want Africans to um, uh, go uh, to to cross the Mediterranean to go to Europe. Uh, but its actions here need to be consistent with giving Africa the opportunity to develop. If we are selling oranges because our farmers and our farm workers produce fantastic citrus fruit at prices that are cheaper than the the Spanish farmers, then give the European um, consumers the benefit of it. Europe doesn't sit with 30% unemployment rate. South Africa has got a bigger challenge of unemployment. And so if we do use every um, opportunity to protect local jobs, I think the world can understand that. We can't understand that for a for a continent that it does very, very well economically. It's a wealthy continent and it has uh, the opportunity uh, to ensure uh, some degree of um, support for our uh, our efforts to grow jobs in South Africa. Honorable Mbuyani, you've raised a very interesting mix of issues. I'm going to um, focus on one of them that I think draws together the different aspects that you've raised, and that is the important relationship between trade policy and global supply chains. All countries now are seeking to uh, to develop a high value supply uh, 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 chains and capacity. The big economic battle uh, that is reshaping our geopolitics is between China and the United States. It's a, it's a fight for global leadership, who's going to be the economic and technological leader of the 21st century. Um, and um, those uh, things are about ensuring that you have the technologies, that you have the wherewithal to be able to provide a decent um, uh, standard of living for your population, whether your population are Americans in the case of the US or Chinese in the case of the uh, People's Republic of China. And so South Africa must navigate that. It provides opportunities for us. There will be reshoring and nearshoring and um, uh, uh, changes in procurement uh, patterns globally by big corporations. We're talking to some of these corporations to say South Africa is a, um, a source uh, for that. And at the AGOA Forum, uh, we hope that we would be able to have a large Made in Africa exhibition that American um, retailers and others would be able to see the breadth of opportunity that Africa provides. Similarly, in our engagement with China, we've made the point that we, we can't just be a supplier of raw materials to China. I, I met with a large Chinese business um, uh, now uh, in February this year and with the, the U.S. Undersecretary for, for, uh, for, trade, for, for State, uh, who deals with cri critical minerals. And in both cases, our point was very similar, that the relationship has to change with the African continent, that the, uh, the, the old paradigm of us being the supplier of raw materials has um, condemned Africa to poverty and uh, recipients of, um, of grants and aid. We want to make our own future. We want to shape our own economies. We want to enable decent work for Africans. And that means that instead of raw materials being exported in raw form, much more of that should have value addition here on the African continent. Honorable Tring made a powerful case for it. Um, of course, we have to navigate the energy challenges now because beneficiation is very energy intensive. But the long, um, the long march, the 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 long term vision is absolutely spot on. Uh, Honorable Mbuyani, that you've raised around global uh, supply chains, and I think it fits very very well in with the um, the points that uh, was made by Honorable Tring and Honorable uh, Shlongyana. And in, indeed, the point made by Honorable Mulder has also been very important about the impact of energy on this, uh, uh, this development. And he made the point that if you want to keep and grow the number of foreign investors that come into the country, we've got to address the energy challenge. So having said all of that, let me conclude by saying that um, the points that you raise, Honorable Mbuyani, goes to the heart of the kind of economy that, um, that we need as South Africans to build 
for South Africa and working in partnership with other African countries that we build for our continent. We don't do it as an act of charity to the rest of Africa. Africa is a large market. Africa is the, the, the engines that are already driving a lot of job creation in South Africa and a lot of our export efforts. And so we do it in ways that African countries can benefit. Honorable members will see many more um, trips to uh, different African countries by the president, by ministers, because we are wanting to make this project of African growth, African jobs, and African industrialization a successful one. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Chairperson, uh, and thank you for indulging uh, us that we could uh, steal a few minutes of the um, the uh, the lunch break of members who I know have other commitments too. Thank you very much, uh, Chair. Thank you very much, Minister. Uh, members, thank you for your inputs and um, and for your robust discussion on the presentations that we have had. Uh, we know that this oversight work is ongoing. Thank you very much to the Minister and the team. Uh, can I just ask uh, the Committee Secretary to speak to us about our program going forward? Um, Chairperson, our next meeting is tomorrow. We will receive a briefing by the National Lotteries Commission on it's the second and third quarter of financial and non-financial performance. Okay? And we'll consider some minutes. Thanks. Thank you very much. We're not ready yet with the oversight report. Is that next week? That will probably be next next week, Chair. Yeah. We have almost, we almost completed, Chair. Hopefully by tomorrow or later today, we will distribute to members, Chair. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to everyone on the platform, uh, members uh, of this portfolio committee and uh, the department uh, led by, by Honorable Ibrahim Patel. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you to the chair, vote of uh, thanks to the chair. Don't leave the chair, don't leave the chair. Thank you, colleagues. Have a good afternoon. Thank you, you Chair. See you in the three-line work meeting or sitting of Parliament, all members present. Thank you.